Thanks, Millie. Uh, over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to highlight the evidence base for use of ustekinumab in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Importantly, I'm not going to talk about safety of therapy, and I'm not going to talk about any of the novel therapies as uh, Dr. Mahadevan is going to cover those. So ustekinumab is a fully human IgG1 monoclonal antibody that binds the P40 subunit of IL-12 and 23. It prevents the binding of these cytokines of the IL-12 receptor, which inhibits IL-12 and 23 mediated signaling, cellular activation, and cytokine production. Um, ustekinumab is approved for treatment of moderate to severe psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis and not yet included in the UC guidelines, but in the ACG practice guidelines, ustekinumab is recommended for moderate to severe Crohn's patients who have failed prior treatments or who have no prior exposure to anti-TNF. So it can be given in a naive population as well. First, I'm gonna summarize the evidence in Crohn's disease. So what you're seeing here is induction response to ustekinumab in Crohn's in the UNITY-1 and the UNITY-2 studies. So UNITY-1 included anti-TNF exposed patients and UNITY-2 was bio-naive patients. And the primary outcome was response at week six, which is in panel A, and that's the, the bars in the middle. So to orient you, placebo is in purple, used to kinumab, 130 milligram fixed dose is in orange, and the approved dose of six milligrams per kilogram IV is in blue. And you can see that approximately a third of patients in the bioexposed group respond um, at week six compared to over 50% in the naive group. And remission rates are of course lower, uh, 15 to 20% in the exposed group and 30% or so in the uh, bio-naive group. Now, in this trial, responders were then randomized to receive either placebo, used to kinumab every 12 weeks in orange, or used to kinumab every eight weeks in gray. And this is looking at the one year outcomes. And you can see that approximately 50% of patients are in remission at one year. Response is maintained in nearly 60%. And this is going to be a common message is that most of the remissions uh, with ustekinumab are indeed steroid free. And if you looked at sustained clinical remission at three different time points at the end of the trial, uh, approaching 50% of patients were in sustained remission. So this is an effective induction and maintenance agent for Crohn's. What about the endoscopic response? So this is a little less impressive. This is a endoscopic substudy of those trials. And we're looking at one year outcomes here. And this is not all from the responders, the short term responders. This includes other patients from the trial as well. The, the left half of this uh, slide shows the mean change in the SCS CD score from baseline at week 44 at week 44. And you can see that it, the mean is about 3.1 reduction in the SESCD. Uh, if you look at the right side of this slide, if you look at a meaningful change, which is a three point or more reduction, about 40% of patients given used to kinumab every eight weeks achieve this outcome. 50% response in ulcers is achieved in about a quarter and complete healing is achieved in about 17% of patients on our standard maintenance dosing of use to kinumab. What about the longer term outcome? So this is data from the open label extension has over five years. So there were 567 use to kinumab treated patients. Um, 237 had been randomized from the maintenance trial and they continued use to kinumab in the long-term extension at their prior dose. Um, overall, over half of patients entering the long-term extension completed their last dosing visit at week 52. This is looking at persistence of clinical remission over five years in an intention to treat analysis. And you can see that the decline in remission seems to be less than what you'd expect with other biologics like anti-TNF. And remember, in these analysis, patients can choose to leave the trial for a number of reasons. It doesn't mean that their disease is worsening. So this doesn't mean that they're losing uh, remission or response. 
If you look at clinical remission at week 52 from all randomized patients who entered the long-term extension, about half of them are in clinical remission. And again, the vast majority of these were steroid free. So it seems like a very durable response. And we're gonna, you'll we'll mirror those results with ulcerative colitis. This is a, a study just presented at UEGW looking at use of kinumab to prevent postoperative recurrence in Crohn's. So it's a little bit of an unusual design. Um, so it was a retrospective cohort of Crohn's patients treated with use of kinumab after intestinal resection at nine centers. The control group had participated in a randomized controlled trial at the same centers, which compared azathioprine alone to azathioprine combined with curcumin. They used propensity score matching to try to make these two groups equal. Uh, their primary outcome was postoperative endoscopic recurrence at six months, uh, defined as a root Garrett's endoscopic score of greater than or, greater than or equal to I2. Importantly, the use of kinumab uh, treated patients had a local read, whereas the azathioprine patients in the trial were centrally read. They had about 30 patients in each group, and the majority of these patients had at least one risk factor for recurrence, which included smoking, fissurizing phenotype, prior resection, a long resection, and and or greater than or equal to two biologics used before surgery. And the high-level results here are that Endoscopic recurrence at six months was about half of what, what you saw in the azathioprine group with the ustekinumab treatment. So a signal here that ustekinumab could be an effective therapy to prevent endoscopic recurrence. So this is a, a real-world analysis looking at uh, ustekinumab compared to vetalizumab in Crohn's patients who have been exposed to uh, TNF previously. So Cycling of therapies is an important clinical question. What do you use next after a drug has failed? Um, so this gives us some data to educate our choices there. Now these are looking at the unadjusted results and you're looking at steroid-free clinical remission on the left and biochemical remission defined as a CRP less than or equal to five or a CalPro less than or equal to 250. And if you look at the one-year results, vetalizumab in blue, ustekinumab in gray, you can see a significant uh, benefit of ustekinumab over vetalizumab. And likewise, for biochemical remission, you can see approximately the same delta, but lower, lower overall numbers. So when they did their propensity score matching uh, to make these patients more similar, they saw uh, likewise trends here. So this is one study um, showing that use to kinumab be, may be a more effective uh, second agent in patients with Crohn's who failed anti-TNF. So this was just presented at UEGW as well. This is Stardust. Um, it's comparing treat-to-target strategy with use to kinumab versus standard of care. So patients had a baseline endoscopy confirming active disease. They received standard use to kinumab induction therapy at week zero and they received a maintenance dose of ustekinumab at week eight. Responders were then randomized uh, to either treat to target arm or standard of care arm. The standard of care arm had dose adjustments per label based on disease flare as confirmed by a physician. Um, the treat to target arm had an endoscopy at week 16. Those that had uh, less than a 25% reduction of their SCSCD from baseline were escalated to every eight weeks instead of every 12 weeks. And if there was a 25% or more improvement, they stayed on Q12 dosing. Now in the next slide, I'm gonna show you how subsequent adjustments were made in the treat to target group. So if they uh, did not achieve tight control, uh, defined as a CDAI of less than 220, and a 70 point or more improvement in the CDI score from baseline. And if the CalPro wasn't less than 250 and CRP less than 10, they could escalate. So they could go from 12 weeks to eight weeks, eight weeks to four weeks. If they are already on four weeks and didn't meet the outcome, they had to leave the study. And what you can see here on the left is the endoscopic response at week 48. And you can see a trend towards improved outcomes in the treat-to-target group in purple. 
And if you look at the last observation carried forward, which is usually a best case scenario, it does become significant. This is similar to what we saw with calm, but it wasn't a calm, of course, was statistically significant. You can see that in both groups, you see a significant decline in symptoms over time. So hard to know how this is gonna impact our practice. I still think we're gonna be aggressive with our approaches, but I think we'd all would have expected to see a bit more robust results uh, from Stardust. Now let's move to UC. Um, so this is again, looking at induction therapy for moderate to severe UC, uh, placebo in white, ustekinumab in light blue, um, the six milligram per kilogram dosing in dark blue, uh, clinical remission using the Mayo score in about 15% of patients, endoscopic improvement, which is a Mayo 01 in about 25%, clinical response in about 60% of patients. And then this is a study that utilized also histologic and endoscopic healing as a composite endpoint. And that was achieved in about 20% of patients at week eight. Now, again, responders will be re-randomized to either placebo, uh, used to kinumab every 12 weeks or used to kinumab every eight weeks. And you're looking here at one year outcomes, about 40% of patients are in remission a maintenance of response is very high here in about 70%. Mucosal healing is about 50%. Steroid-free remission in the majority of patients that have achieved remission. And then remission uh, through week 44 in those in remission at week eight of maintenance was, uh, fairly, was sustained at a fairly high level. Now I broke the, in this table, I'm breaking down your biologic failure patients to the biologic naive patients. In the third and fourth row, we're looking at short-term remission and response rates, and you can see that they're numerically higher in the biologic naive patients. And in the bottom rows, you're looking at week 44 remission and response, and you can again see a numeric, numerically higher difference in the bio-naive patients. So this is seen with all of our drugs, that prior biologic exposure patients do not respond as well. Looking at um, histologic and endoscopic, looking at predictors of outcomes. So this is comparing patients who achieved mucosal healing alone in orange to endoscopic and histologic improvement after induction. And you can see that if you achieve both after induction therapy, the chances of you maintaining a response, remission or steroid-free remission are higher. So getting patients into very deep remission is a very good prognostic factor. What about durability response? This was presented at UEGW. This is looking at the open label extension. Um, first, we're gonna look at stool frequency. So you can see that at maintenance, uh, a, a frequency score of zero one is achieved in about 80%. At long-term extension, it's 80 to 90%. And at the end of the uh, extension, it's still about 80%. So incredible durability uh, in UC. And this is looking at rectal bleeding scores of zero, which are also maintained in maintenance and long-term extension. So speaking to the durability of this agent. And lastly, what about uh, therapeutic drug monitoring? So this is really an area where we don't know as much. Um, so the first um, study here is in the table. This is from a group in Canada. And this was prior to um, approved approval of ustekinumab for Crohn's. So patients were treated with a baseline dose, a one-week dose, a one-month dose, and then maintenance every four to eight weeks. A large percentage of the patients here were actually treated with monthly dosing. And when they did their receiver operating curves, they found that a endoscopic response was more likely if the use to kinumab level was above four and a half, you also saw a more likely biologic response if you achieve that threshold. So suggesting that higher is better. Uh, the study in the figure below here is from the clinical trial data at one year. And you can see that if you're looking at a significant reduction in SESCD score, levels above 2.7 uh, seem to be needed. If you look at endoscopic response, which is a 50% 50 50 reduction, the threshold seems to be a bit lower. And if you look at endoscopic remission, again, it seems to be just, you need it to be 
basically detectable. So I don't think we really know what level we should be shooting for with ustekinumab. So in summary, uh, ustekinumab is an effective agent to induce and maintain remission in moderate to severe Crohn's and UC with best results seen in our bio-naive patients. Response to ustekinumab in both Crohn's and UC is durable over time. A treat-to-target approach is associated with endoscopic improvement in approximately 40% of patients with Crohn's. We know that 40 to 50% of short-term responders with ulcerative colitis treated with ustekinumab will achieve mucosal healing at one year. Ustekinumab may be a viable option to prevent postoperative recurrence in high-risk Crohn's patients, but we meet, need more data here. And that optimal ustekinumab levels to achieve high level endpoints like biologic remission and mucosal healing are not known currently. Thank you very much for your attention.